Alrighty, guys, welcome back to another episode of the show. As always, I am with my wonderful co-host and podcast, all-round good guy, Paulie G. How are you, sir? I'm so very, very well. It's uh, been a wonderful morning so far. I'm very, very excited for the chat that is about to develop. Uh, what has been happening so far this morning? Wonderful is uh, brilliant. You know, that sounds like a great morning. Can you... Yeah, Tell me yeah, what's going on. Fair <laughs> enough. I mean, like, it's in terms of the doing of the morning, it's just yes. been a regular kind of, it's been the same kind of morning that I've had most mornings. But you know how you just wake up with a little bit more pep in your step? Yes. A little bit more zest. Maybe it's the Tokyo teen I had last night, but uh, <laughs> my lower intestines. But yeah. <laughs> I'm just feeling uh, that little bit more uh, glass half full today. I like that. I like that. Well, look, let, let's 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 use that energy. Let's introduce our guest. Our guest is a is a very dear friend of mine, and uh, she is with us today. Um, people who've listened to the My Mate podcast will know her very well. Heidi, there's there's no introduction necessary. How are you, my friend? I'm good. I'm really glad to be here. I'm really. Fu- it's really fun to do a. a- dual host yeah. podcast episode i'm excited because yeah. you and i have done a few together but this is fun to have paulie here to all of us kind of bounce around ideas and stuff so yeah i'm excited to be here Thank you. yeah yeah no it's it's gonna be it's gonna be fantastic it's um it's something that i think paulie and i we we always um we've never really there hasn't been too many op, uh, times where we've kind of like interrupted each other or you know every time we finish the show we like we were dancing quite well there you know yeah <laughs> Absolutely. Pretty good. I kind of feel like I'm a, not on the outer, but like I'm, I'm the less experienced of this dynamic. <laughs> so maybe you guys should be asking me questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we were talking and, you know, we, we definitely see you as the outer. Uh, yeah. so. <laughs> uh, we needed to mention something. I think it's about time you'll be exiting. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, look, Heidi, we, um, we've, we've obviously got so much to talk about um, today and, um, of course, we're going to go into trauma and, and parenting, but I wanted to start off with um, you, you've, you, with the Tash program. You, you've recently just finished the twelve week program. Um, that was really, it was really humbling and, and wonderful to to have um, a part in that as well. How how did all of that go? What were your what are your reflections on it? What are the wins? Yeah, it was really cool. It was one of those things because it was new. Um, I didn't know how it was going to go. Right? I mean, it was a beta. Mm. I've done the parenting program for years and I know that's a well-oiled machine, right? But this one, I was like, you know what? I'm going to take all the concepts that I teach in the clinic and all of the things, or all the things I should say I want to teach in the clinic, but you don't have time for because the therapeutic space is kind of different than like an educational space. Mm. And I'm going to make them into modules and then I'm going to teach them and I'm going to make worksheets and then we're going to have discussions. I think this is going to work. I think after 12 weeks, you guys are going to feel transformed. (laughs) Not totally sure, but I, I'm hoping. And so I was just really like crossing my fingers thinking like, if this stuff works in the clinic, surely it's going to work in this capacity, you know? And it knocked my socks off. Like it mm. was so powerful and it was so amazing to hear the transformations that people had. And it was just so exceeded my expectations. And because as you guys would know, even with like group fitness and stuff, the power of the group Mm. It's a totally different dynamic that changes people's ability to grow and heal and transform. Because when you like, say, for example, have a hard time with compassion, self-compassion, when you hear someone else sharing something that's identical to your experience. Yes. Oh, I can have compassion for her, but I can't for me. Oh, wait, that makes no sense. And then it's easier to have compassion for yourself. So it was Mm. that sort of stuff was cool. The group dynamic. I think people might be hesitant initially. But once you get into it, you realize then no, no, it's so much better because then you have cheerleaders, you have, you know, encouragement built in. It's just, yeah. It's cool. Yeah. Can we just uh, quickly just revise what? what yes. What? Sorry. Yeah. I, I was going to say that before. Yeah. Sorry. How do you go? Yeah. It's called TASH, which is a, the acronym is um, the art of self-healing. So yeah. I basically feel like self-healing and, you know, working on yourself, personal development is an art. I don't think it's, um, one size fits all. I don't think you have to go to therapy. I don't think you have to meditate. I don't think you have to do lots of things that I don't know. Western world says you have to do. I don't think you have to do a lot of things. I think you can do what works for you and what leads you towards the path of transformation and healing is unique to every person. You know, like Mm. art. Tom said this actually art is self-expression. 
think about it. Right. And when he said that, I was like, oh, my God, I'm totally using that. That is so right. Art is all about self-expression. Yes. And that's what I think transformation and healing is about is Mm. you do what works for you. Right. But the thing that I think is missing from therapy is people learning some of the science behind healing and some of the um, concepts about family of origin, trauma, anger, anxiety. And therapy isn't really a space of like teaching in that a little bit, but like not so much. There's so much to teach and so much to learn about trauma and stuff, for example. So yeah, so TASH is basically a 12 week program where I teach you all this stuff that I think you need to know. And essentially it's, it's what I've learned in the last 20 years in my own self-healing, my own journey of what's helped me and helps clients. And then I teach you. Mm. I'd love to just backtrack through the, um, the structure in which you would teach something. Is there some, could you take us through uh, how you would present the information? And then is there a way that you kind of allow uh, the participants of this program to do their own self-work and then, then come back to you and share? Is that, is, is there a structure to that? Yeah. So we just have the content. So there, there are presentations and videos that I've recorded uh, and then they're uploaded to Kajabi, you know, just a, a platform. And yep. then they log into there and they watch the content. So the teaching, like to me, it feels like, it feels like class of um, like you would like go to a lecture, you know, at uni or something where I just sit here and talk and teach the content. And then after that, there's worksheets for you to go through. And then we have our discussion a few days later where it's Zoom, cameras on, and you just go, Polly, what'd you take away from, you know, Monday's class? What'd you learn? Tom, what did you take away? And then you guys might be like, whoa, it really made me realize feelings were not allowed in my home growing up. My dad would just never talk about feelings ever. And I see now how when my kids cry, it really triggers me and it really upsets me. Why? Because it takes me back to when I was a kid and knowing that if I cried around my dad, he would get so mad. Does mm. that make sense? And so then mm. we have this discussion. But then the other thing that I found that really surprised me was the concept of um, having a telegram group. And I'd never like a WhatsApp mm. group, you know, I'd never mm. had that before in a group program. And that was rad because that was like sort of felt offline a little bit. You know, it wasn't Facebook, so it's not as public. Um, but it being, uh, that little bit of private people would open up in there. And then you have this whole group going, oh my gosh, me too. Like that was one of the coolest things is someone shared about some trauma that they'd experienced wow. that they'd never shared with anyone. And they put it in the telegram group. And then, um, a couple other people were like, oh my God, me too. That happened to me as well. Mm. And they were just like, what? I've never heard anyone this happen. It was just, so that was really cool. But so I think the combination mm. of. <laughs> how is it set up is and why I think it's effective is you get the, the best of all the worlds. You get all of the content, like basically all the books that I've read consolidated into the best shit you need to know in 12 weeks. So the, the, the content stuff, then you get the processing stuff in the group where we talk and like digest it. So that has the more therapy vibes to it. And then you have the support group element of the WhatsApp group and the the chat. If that, does that make sense? A hundred percent. Like I know in the past when I've run group programs and facilitated them, I know in a group environment when somebody steps up and they share something that, you know, may be kind of behind closed doors previously, it's a validation for other people to be able to kind of go, well, I actually see myself in this person and I feel validated to be able to step up and now open myself up a little bit more. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, and I think sharing as well. I mean, it's, 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 this is why, um, you know, and we've discussed, I think Paulie and I, we've discussed this as well, but Heidi, especially, you know, just the power of, of group healing, um, in that it is validating for other people and other people go, Oh my God, me too. Such a powerful expression, you know, and then they feel, um, the confidence to, to speak as well. But I think as well for the individual, even just speaking, and you, you notice this in a one-on-one setting as well, but it kind of adds, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it adds a sense of authority to it. When you, when you start to put words to experiences that you haven't done previously, it, it, it separates you from that experience and it, it, it allows you to create ownership of it. And especially something as severe and difficult and as vulnerable as a trauma that has happened in the past, when you can begin to separate from that, 
and see yourself as a separate entity, you, you've already started moving beyond that. And I think something when, when we ran the seminar, Heidi, that I've really um, took um, from, from our, 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 our workshop there was, you know, we were talking about getting people on the path and, and seeing all sorts of things. And these are the right things to say. And we can say, and then you're like, yeah, but Tom, how, like, what if someone's so far back to the point that emotions aren't even this thing they're aware of, you know, they're so, it's so foreign to them. How do we get people on the path when they've never been validated, you know, and that's so powerful because, and I think, you know, the, the, the point that we came to in the end there was if we break it down, that there is, there is always a single first step, you know, that, that someone can make. And maybe that's 20 steps before asking for help, you know, but finding that edge and then starting to move beyond that is, um, is a brilliant way that people can start, um, to, to self heal, which is, um, which is so important in this day and age, you know, when there's so much shit out there and the social media world is saturated, you know? Mm. Yeah, totally. I, I would love to, uh, just, give you an opportunity to define trauma the way you, you see it and the way others have so we can kind of flesh that out as a concept yeah good question uh so i think one of the things that sucks about trauma is a lot of people don't understand it and they don't think it applies to them because i think most people think if i've not been in a horrific car accident where half the passengers died my house burned down i was assaulted in an alleyway you know, if I didn't have cigarettes put out on me when I was a kid, then it's like I don't qualify for having trauma and trauma is for other people over there. That doesn't mm-hmm. happen to me. That's not happened to me. And so people will often say to me, like, oh, I don't need therapy um, because none of those things have ever happened. And therapy is for people who have like real problems. You know, I don't have real problems. And then when I say, OK, um, so this is saying like a first session. So why are you here then? Like, why are you at therapy? It might be, oh, because I'm so anxious, I can't stop worrying about something, or I'm depressed, or I'm just, I have no life satisfaction, or whatever. And then the question that I'll ask that gets them to better reflect on their trauma is, okay, can you tell me about, I don't know, maybe three to five times that stand out in your life where you felt really helpless from birth till now, and you may not even remember it, maybe you only know the stories about it but a time where you might've felt really, really helpless and maybe didn't have the capacity or the tools of how to cope. And then they're like, Oh yeah. yeah. How much time do you have? You know, and I'm like, and there's your trauma. Like so Peter Levine, who's a trauma guru, um, taught me that, uh, that concept, I guess, of his definition of trauma, which is any experience, which is, which makes you feel profoundly helpless or you lose your ability to cope. And when you put it through that lens, then you're like, oh, yeah, when my mom got diagnosed with cancer when I was 18, that was traumatic. Oh, yeah, my parents divorced when I was a kid. That was traumatic. Um, When I had to move schools, when we moved house to a different state and I didn't want to go, then you start to go, oh, there were all these times that I felt really helpless and I didn't know how to cope. And that's then when you start to go, oh, wow, shit, that stuff actually really impacted me. And it doesn't necessarily need to be. I think trauma, people think of like Vietnam War veterans, PTSD. And, you know, I think that's what people think PTSD looks like. And they think that that's what traumatized people look like. And it's like, no, it's not. It's not that. Yes, that is PTSD and trauma. But that's like it's a spectrum, I think. And it's like what see, because like what what is traumatic for me may not be traumatic for you and that guy and that lady over there. Right. Because if if you grew up in Afghanistan during, you know, war times, that kid is going to have a totally different experience and definition of what trauma looks like for them than the kid who grew up in Beverly Hills with parents who are plastic surgeons. You know what I mean? But it doesn't mean that anyone's trauma, like it's not the pain Olympics, right? It's not anyone's trauma is better or worse than the others. It's just all relative. And so if the worst thing that's ever happened to you is you had to move schools when you didn't want to, and then you were the new kid, that is legit. Like, that is mm. possibly that was traumatic for you because you felt profoundly helpless and lost your ability to cope. Is it at the same level as the kid who grew up in Afghanistan and, you know, watched his whole village be bombed and watched his parents die in front of him? No, but who cares? Like it's, it's comparative suffering doesn't work and it doesn't change my experience that I still have, you know, anxiety when I think about starting that first day at school, or I feel a pit in my stomach, like I'm going to throw up when I think about those kids at lunch and how mean they were to me when I was in third grade. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like it, I think it, it, when you look at it through the lens of 
when did I feel helpless? That will help you a lot more in understanding where some of your wounds are and where there's some bits that maybe need to be healed. Mm. Great way to reframe it because think about like language is such a great self, you know, self-relating mechanism and the, 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 the expression that you use two two different uh, arms there are just so powerfully different, but the same, you know? Um, yeah, I love that. You, look, we, we, we talked about trauma being a real uh, specialization for you and uh, in your clinic and how you, you, you've worked with so many people in that and parenting being another uh, arm to uh, what you deal with and the connection. I'd love to kind of flesh out the connection between past trauma and, and parenting and the way yeah. you've seen that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so the reason why they are so overlapping or blending was sort of a surprise to me. I didn't sort of, I didn't anticipate, I guess, me ending up in doing um, parenting work. I, I never sort of set out for that of like, I'm going to build parenting courses and I'm going to speak <laughs> at schools and like talk to parents and educators about how to like not screw up your kids. Like never had that like idea in my head at all. I was more like trauma, die hard, you know, love, trauma, trauma, trauma. But what I started to find is when I would be talking to my adult clients and my teenager clients and my little kid clients, but my adult clients specifically, they would tell me stories about childhood or things that happened. And I would just be like, oh, dude, this is so And in my head. I wouldn't say this a lot, but in my head, I was just like, this is so cringy because this is so preventable. Mm. If I had met your parents back when you were 10 or five, or if I had met you when you were 12. God, this whole thing could have been either avoided completely or really minimized or like really um, dealt with in a really beautiful way that could have, you know, you did six months of counseling when you were 12 and like, then you're good rather than 40 years of addiction and job and relationship issues and all this other crap that didn't kind of need to happen. Um, And so when I sort of started to see this connection of like, oh, prevention oh, I'm in the wrong business, you know, sort of feeling like, um, you know, like for you guys having worked in gyms and knowing, you know, fitness and how bodies work and stuff. Like if you, if you go into a gym and you just see all these people like lifting wrong and you're like, oh, you're going to hurt yourself. I can, I can just see it. You're going to, you're going to pull something in your back. I can Mm. just see it. And then it happen today, but it will happen. Yeah, exactly. And so you're like, you just want to like tap them and be like, you're, kind of about to like pop a disc dude like the way that that's really and you're just sort of looking at them going i could save you so much time money and pain and suffering if you just tweak a couple of things right and so then that's when i started to kind of go i need to get in the prevention business like i need to get in the prevention side of it and that's then when i and also i think working with teenagers and and little kids i found it frustrating a lot that there wasn't a lot of shifting and a lot of change and a lot of transformation because dude there's 168 hours in a week. You spend one hour with a therapist as a kid. That's useless, I think, honestly, if the parents aren't doing their own work or the parents aren't being equipped. Because I think the parents don't have the tools. Why? Because you were raised by rookies. We were all raised by rookies. So it's like, one, you don't really know how to parent effectively because the, the parent school that you went to is your childhood, which is not necessarily you know awesome because our parents were rookies as well. But then the other thing is if if you need to learn, say you're a kid who goes for anxiety and you need to learn how to manage your anxiety, it's so much more effective. If I spend one hour with the parents every week, then they have 168 hours to be working with their kid on the anxiety, like makes so much more sense. Mm. And then when I started working with parents, I realized kids were like transforming left, right and center by giving the parents the tools. So basically what I started to do with parenting was give them the tools that I would be teaching the kid in, you know, like in my brain and putting it into the parents' brain so that they can then work it. But as far as trauma goes, the connection to that. So that's sort of the the backwards, the preventative connection of like, let's not get our kids so traumatized. Let's, let's improve our parenting so they don't get so traumatized. But then the other piece around that is so many parents have unprocessed trauma and unhealed wounds and just shit from childhood, basically that they've dismissed, minimized, said, doesn't really affect me. It's not a big deal. And I'm just like, Yes, it affects you. Yes, it's affecting your parenting. And the saddest part of all, you don't even see it. You have blind spots. I mean, we all have blind spots, but like parents, especially that have not done any therapy or any kind of work on them. And and when I say therapy, that could be Tony Robbins. I could be watching a bunch of Oprah. I don't really care what it is. 
but it's like working <laughs> on yourself, that. you know, like <laughs> reflective um, introspection, you know, journaling, mm. like it doesn't have to be therapy. But I just, I say therapy is like a one word for all of that sort of stuff. Mm. Personal development. If you're a parent who has not done that stuff, like, oh, buckle up, buddy, because parenting is going to be a ride, man, because our kids, as annoying as it is sometimes, are our greatest teachers. They are little mirrors. They just pulled up to you. Here's all your wounds. Here's all your unprocessed stuff. Here's all your crap from childhood that you haven't worked through. Here you go. That's that's what they do. Like I say that they're little Yodas all the time. They're they they are. They're very challenging, but they damn, they make you grow. And they and you think, you know, like I was already, I don't know, 12 years into doing therapy by the time I had kids. And so I was like, I know my shit. I know my trauma. I know my triggers. I've healed through it all. And then Kids come along and it's like, whoa, there is like layers of an onion, you know, it's like there's yeah. so much more to do. So that's the other piece that I think. And dude, I cannot even tell you the number of times parents have come into my office because they've seen a webinar. They've seen something I've done online and they go, I want to see you one on one. And they come in and they, you know, because I want you to help me with my crazy kid or whatever. And they think we're there to talk about the kid. And then I go in to tell me about your childhood. Tell me how you were parented. And then they're kind of like, what does this have to do with our kids? And I'm like, mm. everything. <laughs> and the stories, you guys, the stories people will tell me about um, parents committing suicide, um, family violence, um, things that they witnessed, um, drug use, substance abuse, weapons, um, crazy levels of violence um, that they witnessed as children. And then mm. I'll say, have you done any work? Have you done any therapy? No, no. And I'm like, oh my God, whoa. And you don't think there's any connection to your kid and what's going on for them. Don't think that's kind of impacting you. Wow. Mm. And I, then I'll be like, dude, we got to, you know, like dad, you got to stay after we got to, we got to <laughs> hang out and spend some time together to process some of what you just said, because dude, that's, that is some gnarly childhood stuff because your kids mm. will then trigger you. And again, the thing is blind spots. You don't even know why is my kid making me feel ragey? Why is my kid triggering me in this way? And it's like, because six, your six year old kid is triggering the little six year old in you, you know? Yeah. yeah that's Does awesome. That sense? Does that make sense? Uh, completely. And I, I think it's, sorry, Tommy. You go. No, 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 not. It's uh, I mean, um, it makes total sense. And I think one of the, uh, the, um, the the negative com- or, or downsides I think to it is is that um well do, do you, what what do you think Heidi do you feel like that the the child or the teenager and so forth actually becomes the one to blame but is really just a symptom of what's going on at home absolutely yep ten thousand percent ninety eight percent of the time when I work with a family. I'm always like, this is a system. This is a Mm. family system. Don't y'all be isolating the kid and putting them out to the side as they're the the bad one and they're the naughty one and they're the troublemaker, whatever. It's a system. You can't, you can't, it's like, you know, cogs, cogs in a machine. Mm. If you, if you change the speed of this one, those cogs interlock with the others. So if you change the speed of this one, it's going to impact this one, which is going to impact this one and this one. So you can't just isolate any family member, just dad, just mom, just kitten. No, it's all together. And usually, yeah. most of the time, the, the behavior that the kid is exhibiting, the self-harm, suicidal ideation, risk-taking, whatever, is, is like the, the um, manifestation of the unprocessed stuff from the parents and, mm. and generations even back. It doesn't mm. even necessarily have to be just the parents. It could be sometimes there's kids that we go three generations deep where some of this stuff comes from. It's not, it doesn't, there's a great book by Mark Wolin called It Didn't Start With You. And it's mm-hmm. basically all about generational trauma and ancestral stuff and how it's passed down. And the thing, I, I feel compassion because I think just a lot of people don't know it. Like it's just, you don't know. You sure. don't know what you don't know, right? Sure. So it's an, to me, it's more of an ignorance thing that it's um, parents don't realize that what's happening for my kid is a manifestation of the whole system and is mm-hmm. a, a reflection back of my unprocessed stuff and they're just mirroring it back and i don't Mm. say that for if for parents listening going oh i'm such a bad parent you know or like that i'm parent shaming or parent blaming again you don't know what you don't know so it's not your fault that you but i what i would like to say to that is 
just stop blaming your kid that they are maybe just the mouthpiece. Maybe they are just mm. a whistleblower who's bringing attention to the fact that we got a real issue in this system around shame, or we have a real issue in this family around perfectionism, or we have a real issue in this family around we just don't talk about our feelings. And then, so what do you get? A kid who's real explosive with their feelings. Mm. And do you see what I mean? So it's mm. like, they're never in isolation because dude, kids come out like perfect. They, they're, they're as close to the source. They're pure and blank canvas as possible. And then they, we just screw them up basically as they get older. Yeah. <laughs> us, yeah. us, school, you know, academics, like that whole institution, you know, yes, and yes. Environment and media yep. and, Social media, it's just, yeah, then they just get all messed up, but, but they come out pure. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I can, I can definitely, uh, this, this whole conversation resonates very deeply with me. I have a, I have a four-year-old going on five year old girl, uh, uh, daughter, should I say, and a, uh, a little boy who's, um, one and a half, but. I was going through a, a period with my daughter where, uh, you know, w- w- there, there was struggle there and I felt uh, that when I was responding with, you know, when I was responding to the struggle with more struggle uh, and perhaps a little significant frustration, um, spikes of aggression, but then down, down. And, and once I caught myself and I feel like listening to uh, an interview with you may have been the, uh, kind of uh, instigator for me to kind of check myself and to be able to say, hang on, this is, this, this is all within my control. My part in this is within my control. Once I realized that and once I was able to actually have a point of self-reflection and um, play my part in the dynamic, it was almost like magic. <laughs> Um, the way my daughter responded to that situation because, and and it wasn't, I can't, my intention into that situation of that point of conflict was not, I'm going to try and control my daughter here. It's like, what can I do to, um, to be able to respond in a kind, loving, intentional fashion and, uh, take it from there. And then, like I said, it was like magic. She followed suit. And it doesn't always happen like that, but um, it was pretty miraculous the way that kind of manifests. Totally. And I hear that all the time, dude, that people will say they watched a, um, I have this little mini course it's called Spicy Masterclass, which is basically for spicy kids that are defiant, strong-willed, kind of just spirited little people. Um, I call them spicy. Um, <laughs> sorry. Yes. I, I, I know. I'm familiar with the spicy child. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. And that masterclass, dude, I get email because we um, have it. We do a lot of Facebook advertising in the States and stuff. And so I get emails like legit daily from people all over the world saying I did the spicy masterclass and it changed our life within like a week. Our kid is totally different. Wow. And it's like, it's, which is super like, that's super cool to hear. It's really rewarding. But um, what, is so cool about that, I think, is that it's so simple. Sometimes there's little hacks that you can do that just have a huge impact. And like you said, it feels like magic is what a lot of parents will say. And I'll, I'll just give you guys a, two of the things I would say that are probably the biggest. Or th- I'll give you three. So one is the sentence, you're a good kid having a hard time. Because so often kids who are spicy, uh, all kids, I think, are so worried about being perceived as bad or being told that they're naughty. Uh, so saying things like um, that was so naughty or don't be naughty or you're a good boy, you're a good girl. I always say to parents, like, let's just let's just take that out of it and instead say you're a good kid having a hard time when they're having mm. a meltdown, because what they often are feeling is that I'm bad and I'm unlovable because I'm having these ragey outbursts or whatever. So meeting them with that sort of compassion and stuff. Um, the second thing I would say is shame. A lot of parents don't realize how often they shame. Uh, why? most of us were shamed as kids. And so it feels really normal. And so we don't realize we don't, we can't see it, but that's what it Mm. is. Um, And so some great examples would be like, um, Polly, you have your two kids sitting at the table and you might say to your daughter, you know, your brother's been sitting here for five minutes and he's eaten more than you. And look at you, you're older than him. 
you know, you're a big girl, you're four years old, and he's sitting here for five minutes and he's eaten almost all of his dinner. And you've been sitting here for 20 and you barely have anything. Stop goofing off and start eating. Right. These mm. little ways that we shame that we don't realize are actually shaming and making children feel bad about who they are, like at their core. Right. And so spicy kids, especially cannot handle shame like shame is like their kryptonite it makes them feel 10 times worse it often leads to more explosive behavior and so even just that like stop stop well being aware that you're shaming and then stopping shaming can be game changing with all kids but spicy kids especially um and then the third thing i would say is understanding brain development and understanding how different our brains are and how different their brains are so that example that you just gave of like when i started to meet her instead of meeting her with struggle and starting to meet her sort of me calming down then she would calm down is a great example of um, what you just described is the, the difference between brain development. And so the cortex, the part of the brain that's responsible for forward planning, logic, emotional regulation, motivation, productivity, um, impulse control, um, all of that good stuff, that part of the brain, the cortex doesn't fully develop until you're around 25 to 28. And then you look at the amygdala, the other part that kind of drives behavior in children, which is all about like fear. Um, safety, uh, protection, you know, the amygdala is just there to basically keep you safe. It's your security guard, right? And kids are predominantly driven by their amygdala because their cortex isn't fully online yet. So when we have these frustrations with our kids of like they have poor impulse, impulse control, it's like, well, of course, dude, because the part of the brain that regulates the impulse is not there yet. So it's like you can't get mad at them or think or it's like I think what a lot of parents do is they get mad at their kids um, thinking you chose that behavior, you know, like why mm. won't you listen? Why won't you sit at the table? Why won't you get your shoes on? Why won't you whatever? And it's like, no, 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 dude, it's not won't. It's can't. They can't get their shoes on by themselves. They can't remember 20 <clears throat> steps ahead. They can't sit still because their body can't regulate for that long. So I think those are kind of some three little nuggets that just implementing that shift can be powerful for families, especially with those with like strong little kids. But all parents, I think those are really great concepts to understand. Yeah. Um, Heidi, could you talk to us about the significance of shame, perhaps like elaborate on what shame is and why it is so, so, um, so severe, especially in, in, you know, um, uh, when you have kids who are younger. Yeah. So shame is like one of my favorite topics, as you know, I could probably talk about this for like 24 hours. <laughs> Um, the study that blew my brains out was when I first learned about the Grant study. And the Grant study is one of Harvard's most prestigious, you know, fancy, famous studies. It's still running. Um, it's been running for about 75 years. And at the 55 year mark, they basically decided we want to collect all the data. The data being they started following these kids when they were babies. And from babies till then at 55, when they sort of gathered all the data they wanted to see let's see with all of these people we were doing this research on what are their lives like and like they're 55 they're proper grown-ups what happened in their lives to make them the way that they are and they found these two totally significantly different kind of cohorts in the data mm -hmm. one group has really high levels of anxiety depression eating disorders divorce uh relationship issues job issues low life satisfaction just like High levels of not loving life and mm. not crushing it. Okay. Then another group, lower, same things, but way, 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 way lower levels. So they see these two significant differences in the groups and they're like, wow, this is wild. What's the correlation? You know, these guys with the high levels, what, what's the, what do they all have in common? Yeah. All of them had in common the same parenting style. These guys with the lower levels, parenting style. But then mm. specifically when they went deeper into well, what kind of parenting styles, the ones with all the issues were raised in strict, harsh, shame-based parenting styles. And the ones with all the low levels were raised in compassionate, empathetic, loving, safe. Like, And I don't mean safe as in physically, but that too, but emotionally safe environments. Mm. And when I learned this data, and it was you know, essentially like this is the power of shame and understanding the impact and the legacy of shame mm. having a tool in your parenting toolkit is so dangerous so mm. dangerous and this is part of why i'm a nerd and i love data and i love research is like dude you cannot argue with that yeah so when i'm doing this in a presentation and i share that and i have that all in a slide when i share that and say so for those of you in the audience who are who want to say to me 
Yeah, but strict parenting works. Um, it's effective. Or shame-based parenting works. I go, no, you look at this data and that's then how you know this is where your kid's going to end up. Yep. If that's what you want, good luck to you. Have a nice yeah. life. But I don't think that's what you really want. And you don't want your kid to suffer. You don't want your kid to be in that column of all of those issues. No. Um, and so what's the what's the core thing then is stop shaming. Mm-hmm. But first, you got to be re- like you got to be aware that you're even doing it because most parents aren't even aware. Like that example of sitting at the table, it's subtle. It's often, mm. it's often in these little micro moments that parents shame. You know, um, what's wrong with you? You're nine years old. Your sister is six. Why can't you get dressed? She can get dressed. Come on, hurry up. Those yep. these little ways that um, parents shame that that um, body image. Uh, you know, commenting on their body, shaming their body, their size, how things look. Um, their clothes, their fashion choices, you know, there's so many different ways that um, parents can shame their kids, athletics, academics. But the the problem with shame is when you shame a child, what you are actually doing is making them think that they are the problem and that they are incapable of change. Mm -hmm. So shaming a child is powerful because you're not shaming the behavior. Drawing on the wall, you know, like those markers are bad. No, when you shame the child and say you're bad for drawing on the wall, it's me that's bad. Mm. Difference of yeah. shame, you are bad. Guilt is drawing on the wall. The behavior is not what we're going for. But and when, what, sorry. No, no, you can t- continue, please. What, what most parents do is they shame the child rather than, dude, drawing on the wall, not so cool. Mm. Or punching your sister, not so cool. You are lovable. You are good. But it's the behavior and that separating of the two mm, is what we nice. want to do. But what most parents don't know to do. Why? Because that's how we were raised. Most of us were shamed by our parents. Um, so that's why you don't even realize, one, you don't realize you're doing it. Um, especially certain cultures, certain religions. Shame is like a huge piece of the toolkit. Is, you know, mm. Shame is massive. Mm. Um, and when you don't realize that you're doing it, you don't, you just, you don't realize how damaging it is. And the hallmarks of shame are um, disconnection and isolation, right? So when I am in shame, I want to disconnect. So you think about a dog who gets in trouble. What do they do? They put their head down, they break eye contact, and they look away. And so oftentimes when children are in shame, they do the same thing. Mm-hmm. They want to just disconnect because I think I'm so bad and I'm so unlovable. And the antidote to shame is vulnerability, connection, empathy, compassion. Mm. And it's hard because a lot of times in those moments where kids have done something wrong, that's the last thing you want to do is be compassionate and empathetic to them, right? Because you're on the wall. You just punched your sister. But that's actually what they need to step out of it, right? They need, we all need when we're in shame. We need someone to kind of reach into the shame hole and go, dude, you're still lovable. You're human. You made a mistake. That's all right. We're all learning. Fine. Mm. Yeah. That's what you need to get out of a shame hole. But that's often what parents don't do. I send you to your room. I put you in timeout. Lots of shamey, right, yeah. shamey things. Does that make sense? Mm. It's such a challenging uh, process that you just kind of uh, articulated there and so subtle as well, you know, mm. but, uh, shining a spotlight on the action rather than the human. It's like we, we, we've been brought up with a, a way of thinking and a way of communicating. So you're on autopilot when you actually are quote unquote disciplining uh, a, a child. Um, so you, there's this, there's this unconscious rewiring that needs to take place, which yes. is super challenging, right? Like you're, you're, you're undoing 40 something years of uh, yes. work from, from, from way back in early childhood, that's deep seated somewhere that you, like you said, you can't even identify. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. For, for a lot of uh, parents out there that are listening to this and they're like, fuck. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah. Whoops. Ooh. <laughs> oh. I hear. Yep. I'm now identifying this and I'm like, this is, this is me. Um, <laughs> my child is X years old. How can I, like, is, am I too far gone? Is my child too far gone? Is there any point, you know, like, is, um, what, what do you have to say to that? that that's the $3,000 program, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, you are too yeah. far gone. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you. <laughs> um, I think it's, uh, no, you're never too far gone. I mean, dude, I'm 40, how old am I? 42. If my parents came to me today 
and said, Heidi, I'm so sorry for shaming you as a kid. I realize locking you in your room, putting you in timeout, spanking you was not cool. And I'm sorry. And that wasn't the right, right, right way to roll. And I wanted you to know I'm, I'm doing my own work now and I'm exploring some of the stuff and I wanted to let you know. How many of us would be like, no, that's annoying. Like, no, we would all be like, thanks. Thank you. Mom and dad. Yeah, like, <laughs> I'm not crying. I, yeah, I, I would appreciate that, right? So to me, the question of is it too late? No, it's never too late. Uh, I have a lot of parents that join my parenting program that have teenagers, basically because shit hits the fan when kids are teenagers. If you parent, especially for those of you that like to parent through a lot of tight grip and control and micromanaging, you have learned in the teenage years or punishment, you like the punishment vibe. Um, In the teenage years, it really blows up in your face because that's when you really realize that you have no control over your children. Everyone has no control over their children, but when they're little, you can control them because of size and because of their brain development again, Mm -hmm. and you can put them in the room and you can um, not let them leave the house and things like that. Right. But then when they're teenagers and they have more agency and they have more ability and sophistication, they can sneak out, they can steal, they can go do stuff. Right. So you, any sense of control that you think you have over your children is an illusion. And then when they are teenagers, it really blows up in your face and it's sort of revealed to you. No, you don't. You have no you have no control. So is it too late, though? And and so that's why I sorry, I think that's why a lot of parents come to me when their kids are teenagers is because they're like, I'm desperate. I don't know how to help my kid. And obviously what I've been doing the last 13, 14, 15 years isn't working. Um, What do I do? And I'm like, stop punishment. And you got to just revamp the whole system. And we need to hang out for a while so, so I can teach you some of these different ways of being as a parent. Mm. But even still starting it in teenagerhood. And I've had a lot of um, families that I've worked with that their kids will say to them, I can tell there's like a line in the sand moment when mom and dad started doing Heidi's program and when they were not doing Heidi's program. That, and, and what is that change? That they became parents that I could go to. They became parents that I um, could talk to about my problems, that I could call at 2 a.m. and say, I'm drunk somewhere and I don't know where I am. Can you come and get me? There's all of these things that shifted in our relationship after my parents learned new skills and tools. And I'm so grateful because then I was able to go through my teenage years or repair the relationship so that now I'm, you know, now I'm 25 and now I'm able to have a relationship with my parents. And I actually like hanging out with them, even though I don't have to, because they shifted stuff and they started doing things differently. So no, it's never too late. Obviously the earlier, the better. A lot of parents who've done my program have said, I wish that you left the hospital with like your program in your little bag, <laughs> um, you know, when you're going home with your baby. Um, I, and I would love that too. I think that would be great. Um, but yeah, I think the earlier you can get in the better, basically just so you don't get into bad habits. Like, so you don't get into the habit of shaming, you know, but so, and as far as the, um, the, when, you know, you do it, it's never too late because it only, it just has to start with awareness. So like, even if someone's listening to this and they're like, Whoa, this made me realize how much I shame, or this made me realize how much I don't take into consideration their immature brain development. Hmm. I'm going to take that into account. I'm going to start using the line. You're a good kid having a hard time. Just that. So just starting with the awareness can be like the, the gateway drug to lots of other sort of growth and development and just being aware that maybe I'm the one that needs to change some stuff and not so much my kid. Yeah. But so, so Heidi, what about, cause I can imagine um, parents say who've grown up with that kind of uh, traditional authoritarian model. Um, and they still say, well, okay, so I understand all that. I understand shame um, and the, the antidote being empathy and compassion and so forth. How do I, how do I compassionately expose my child to challenges to help them cultivate independence and so forth. Um, because you can imagine that, um, you know, perhaps pushing someone out there or doing these things to learn hard lessons, you know, could be justified in a way of, well, I want them to become an adult and grow eventually, but how do how, how, so what if someone is listening to this and going, well, yes, that's me. How can we reconcile the two there? Hmm. I think it's, revamping your understanding of what resilience means. A lot of people think resilience means go drink a cup of concrete and harden up, right? That's what, that's what most people think resilience is. And it's just bouncing back. You know, I disagree. I think what resilience means is actually emotional regulation and learning Mm. how to regulate your nervous system. That's what you need to be teaching your kids more resilience, millions, whatever that to me, resilience is a byproduct. 
instead of focusing on building resilient kids, focus on teaching them emotional regulation. Well, hang on a second. If you want to teach someone how to emotionally regulate, you have to emotionally regulate. That's hard. Mm. Why? Back to the whole your childhood shit that you've not processed, right? Why is it you don't understand your feelings? You don't know why they trigger you, why you yell, um, why you shame, all that sort of stuff. So it first has to start with you regulating yourself, modeling emotional regulation for your child, teaching them how to emotionally regulate, how you breathe through, how you manage the balance between regulating your body and regulating your mind and, you know, mantras. But I believe in a bottom up approach, which means regulate the body first and then the mind sort of follows later. But modeling that, teaching them that and then teaching them how to emotionally regulate. That's one piece. And then the second piece is connection. If we don't have a connected relationship, how the hell am I supposed to guide you and influence you in this life? So if we know that control doesn't work, because like, think about it, any job you've ever had, if you had a boss that was micromanaging and controlling, did it make you want to learn from them? No. Did it make you want to do good for them? No. It made you afraid of them. It was not respect. Yeah. Don't bullshit me with that whole thing. Yeah. My parents were strict and they, you know, I did what they said because you were afraid of them, dude. Not because mm. that's not respect. That is not respect. That is fear. Yeah. That's what drove you to do everything they said and listen the first fear of being hit or being in trouble or getting the silent treatment. That's not respect. If you are connected to your children, what does that mean? If you are connected to someone, if, if you and I have a connected relationship, what does that mean? We are respectful to each other. We honor each other's wants and needs. We both encourage each other to live our best life and for you to have choice, for you to have autonomy. We encourage each other to be our best selves. Mm. When you are connected and in a, in a connected relationship, that's what it looks like. Not power over. I'm smarter than you because I'm older than you. I'm smarter than you because I'm bigger than you. I can make you do what I want because I'm bigger than you. Mm -mm. That's not connection. Mm. That's abuse. That's shitty. That's like, who wants to be in a relationship like that with someone where they have power over me? Where I I believe Eckhart Tolle taught me this, that parents are only temporarily smarter than their children. And it's not really smarter than it's more. I have more knowledge and more life experience, but not necessarily smarter than you. A lot of times children are way smarter than adults. They understand a lot more things than grown ups do. Kids are so clear on who they are. They are so yes. clear on, on what matters to them and what they need. I need to wear my Superman costume to the grocery store and I don't care. Right. There's this <laughs> knowing cool. that. Right. There's <clears throat> this knowing that children have of they don't give a about what other people think they are so true to who they are babies i cry when i need something now you know like they <laughs> yeah. go and they have no problem asking for what they need and as they get older it gets beat out of them by us because mm. we tell them to put their wants and needs away anyway mm. my point is i think we have to um we have to start by looking at ourselves and we have to start by realizing it's not anything else, fill in the blank, resilience, kindness, intelligence, hard work ethic, perseverance. No, that's not where you need to start. None of that shit happens if you don't have an emotionally regulated person. You mm. don't have a regulated nervous system. It has to start with that. So teaching your children first how to have regulation and second, having it. But I think actually first before that would be a connected relationship because I can't teach you anything if we're not connected. If you think I'm just bossy and telling you what to do all the time, you're not going to listen to me. So first, we focus on our connected relationship, which is a respectful relationship. Second, then I teach you how to regulate, but I only have to learn that first. And then I regulate, I teach you how to regulate, and then you can go do amazing stuff. Amazing stuff. It's it's them. amazing because like uh, like just as I'm hearing you talk, I'm trying like I'm like connecting the dots with other things, and um, you know, even as something like. Yeah, because I think I think you're so right, and I think like resilience is often synonymous with like doing hard shit, you know, like the stone cold like military person, or you know, doing these crazy challenges and stuff. And what what I've noticed in in doing jujitsu, it has this second positive effect, which I never thought would happen. It's been completely unrelated to jujitsu at all, mm. right? So jujitsu forces you to regulate your breathing, because if you don't, and you're rolling with someone who's better than you, and they're crushing you. And your breathing's out of whack. Your nervous system is much more aroused. And then, as as you said, body up approach. We call this body meets mind podcast for a reason. You know, body up. Um, 
uh, you, you start to get anxious thoughts. And then when you get anxious thoughts, your breathing becomes even more out of whack. And then, and you're making these shit decisions that it's going to force you to lose the match. So what I've really noticed is just by learning to regulate my breathing, I'm, I'm better at jujitsu, but I'm also far better at home with my dogs. <laughs> like when I am with my dogs and they're, they're, you know, say I'm reading a book or something, they're all over the place. I notice how the difference between me being a good owner at home and then being a good partner as well is a lot of the stuff that I've learned. I've been forced to learn uh, on, on the mats with jujitsu with controlling my breathing. So it, it's, it's amazing. And I, and I never, I never signed up for jujitsu to be like, Hey, look, I'm not the best with dogs. So uh, can I, can I start wearing that white belt? <laughs> you know? But um, yeah. it, it's amazing how emotional regulation is, is, is the thing when it comes to resilience. That's really cool. It's, I really like that. It's it's everything. It's not because then to me what the it's the byproduct, right? If mm. I can emotionally regulate and I can do a bottom up approach, I start by regulating my body, then I can regulate my mind, you know, and I can get my head sort of straight, but it has to start here by making my body feel safe. If I can then do that, think about it. Then you can bounce back quicker. Mm. I fall down, I lose a job, somebody dumps me. I get a bad grade. If I know how to emotionally regulate, I am more resilient Then mm. I can bounce up. But also I'm also resilient because I have someone in my corner who gets me, who understands me, who validates me, who helps me get back up and who helps me learn from that experience. Right. Mm. But that's only if I have a connected parent in my corner. The, the analogy I use is in boxing, you know, there's the corner man, like that's their technical title is the corner man who sits in the corner in between rounds, the boxer finishes the round, they go sit in the corner and the corner man massages their shoulders, says, you know, oh, you know, the dude's right hook. That was really, it was really out of nowhere, but I think your left hook was really good there. I think if we try a little bit of some jabs and then we do that and the corner man's whole purpose, if you read a corner man's book, it says to instill confidence in the boxer, to build them up, to tell them what they're doing well, not to just sit and shit on them for the, the five yeah. minute, you know, break that they're between rounds. It's to build them up and pump them up and tell them what they're doing right and to show them the opponent's weakness. That's that's their job, right? And that's what parents need to be. Mm. We need to be better corner men. Mm. So when they come off, you give them water, you massage their shoulders, and you're like, all right, bud, you got this. Out you go. And then <laughs> they go back out. That is how you build resilience, right? Because if you are that person that they keep coming back to when stuff blows up and things fall apart in their life, they keep coming back to you because they are connected and in a loving, safe, respectful relationship with you. They keep coming back to you. You have that ability to help them be resilient. If you are not that, then every time something blows up and they come back to you and you yell at them and you shame them and you tell them how stupid they are, that does not build resilience. That that lowers self-esteem, that lowers confidence, that makes their body feel unsafe. It does not help them regulate. They then turn to substances and all sorts of other crap mm. to help them regulate or better word, numb and avoid so they don't have to feel their feelings because feelings feel too overwhelming. So if you are being the connected corner man and teaching them how to regulate their body, and regulate their emotions and regulate their nervous system, that is how you build resilience. I think. Mm. Amazing. So powerful. And it makes you think about the way the gold standard of parenting has been, uh, you know, kind of articulated and demonstrated in the past, you know, seen, not heard, but, but it's, but it's always still articulated this way as well. It's like, mm. You get, you know, the peanut gallery loves to kind of chime in uh, and say you're being, you know, you're being weak, uh, uh, weak, you know, things like weak parenting, um, you know, you're letting them walk all over you. All of these types of expressions are, are, are really, really, um, and, and they also um, allow parents to second guess themselves and their parenting skills that they're, they're kind of looking to develop and harness. So it's a very, very challenging process for a parent to be able to change the paradigm of parenting in 2022 and beyond. You know? mm. Yeah. But I think what's the, like, what's the alternative, right? Correct. To me, the exactly. alternative, the alternative is a kid that ends up in the grant study at Harvard that ends up having, you know, high levels of all of that stuff. And mm. I think like it's, I think it starts when they're little. I think when you're at the grocery store and your toddler is having a tantrum and throws himself on the floor, that's when it starts. 
I think that's when that's when you start learning how to tune everyone out. I focus on my child. I regulate myself and I'm there with my child. And it's just you and me, buddy. And we're tuning everyone out. And if Grandma Ethel over there is giving me the side eye of like, oh, my God, you're being too soft on him and you're being too sensitive and you need to just tell him to get up and stop acting this way. I tune all those people out. I focus on me and my child and I am doing what I know is best for them and is what's going to lead to to us having a connected long term relationship. Because to me, I'm playing the long game. And this is what I think is so cool about having been a trauma therapist or am a trauma therapist is I have that lens on everything where I'm like, dude, I'm playing long game. I want you to have a relationship with your kids when they're 30 and 40 and they don't have to hang out with you and they don't have to depend on you. I want them to want to choose to spend holidays with you and their birthday with you. I don't want them to, you know, move far, far away and never want to see you. Mm. It's like, why did we have kids if we're never going to like, you know, like just when they get cool, when they get, you know, into adulthood and you can have conversations with them, they just go and leave because you've parented them through control and such a rigidity and shame that they don't want to hang out with you because you suck. You know, I don't think any of us want that. I, so I'm trying to. <laughs> because you suck. Game. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's perfect. Okay. It is. How do you, I feel like I, we could talk forever and ever and ever, <laughs> but uh, I feel eventually this, uh, this conversation needs to draw to a conclusion for now. I'd love to have you back on the show because yeah. I keep talking to you forever and ever. Um, but as a parting kind of question, is there something that comes to your mind that, uh, and, and let's just keep it around parents for now, that parents can activate within themselves, within their own minds, or a question that they can ask themselves or an action that they can take today that can kind of spark that, that new journey? Yep. I think two things is one, really dive deep into self-compassion. If you don't know anything about self-compassion, you've got to start there. Like in cash, that's our first module is self-compassion. Um, whenever I do presentations, one of the first things I say is I want you to have a big pill of self-compassion right now, because if I'm about to teach you some things that make you feel bad or you go, Oh my God, I've been doing the wrong thing. Um, Everything Heidi said not to do is what I've been doing. <laughs> have some self-compassion. So start, start there. Of, um, we do the best we can with the information that we have. Right. And our parents, I don't blame them either. I think it's just, we're all doing our best and, and our parents raised us or beat us or did whatever because they didn't know. And their parents did the same to them. And it just goes back and back and back. So I think first is self-compassion and having kindness to yourself that you didn't know. And now, you know, different information. So maybe you start trying to tweak things. So that would be one thing. And then the second thing I think is sort of an actionable thing is just start reflecting on if you're about to interact with your child, start reflecting by adding a little pause rather than reacting, reflect instead, and just take a moment to, um, instead of reacting, responding. And in that response, you see the difference, like responding rather than reacting. Mm. You have a, there's a little gap, right? Where I get to choose and think how I'm going to respond. Just ask yourself, okay, how I'm about to respond, how I'm about to, to meet my child in this moment. What do I know from my own childhood? How would my parents have handled this? How did that feel when I was little? Is it possible that I'm just doing this on autopilot? Or is it possible that I could maybe choose another option that's maybe more kind or maybe more compassionate? And then the, the second piece that, so stop and ask, what do I know about my, this from my own childhood and how it was handled? And then the second piece is, is what I'm about to do or say going to build connection or disconnection? And using that as a filter through every interaction you have with your kid. And if it's going to build disconnection, can I either not do it? Can I say it in a different way? Or just handle it differently somehow? Or maybe I just need to take a minute to calm down a little bit. But using the, is this disconnecting or connecting um, as your sort of filter before you interact with the child? Mm, mm. Heidi, what's uh, coming up for you next couple of months? Uh, I'm going to start writing a book. Oh, so brilliant. brilliant. Yeah. I'm going to start writing nice. a book. I get that question a lot. And so I, and I've been wanting to, but I just, you know, time and I'm a, more of a talker than a writer. So it's mm-hmm. harder for me to write. So I just have to <laughs> buckle down and do it. Yeah. Um, so starting to write a book uh, nice. and then we'll do our next intake, I think of Tash in maybe February and then the parenting program. We might do a little intake um, maybe in January. I think for some people who um, need time during the 
Australian summer that they want to spend some time doing parenting stuff. So yeah, I always have stuff going. So yeah, people can just go to my website or Instagram and um, stalk me and find things that I have cooking. Yeah. Yeah. What, what are your websites, social medias? Give, give us yeah. the, uh, the links. Website, website is HeidiRogers.com and Instagram is HeidiRogers underscore. Brilliant. Well, hey, it's always uh, such a pleasure catching up with you, my friend. A good good time doing it um, with the co-hosting thing as well. You know, this is uh, this has been good. And one of the reasons I think Paulie and I love doing it is because um, two different angles, you know. Paulie, you, you'll be asking questions that I wouldn't think of. Hopefully I do the same and hopefully we get a more rounded um, um, perspective and we can get to go deeper in topics we wouldn't normally do. So it's, uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you guys for having me. And thanks for the great questions. It's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you so much guys for having me on your, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's all right, mate. Uh, we'll be expecting a bit of money for that, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> all right, guys. Hey, thank you so much for listening. And, uh, we will speak to you next time on the show. Bye-bye. Bye.